Hello, and thank you for choosing to spend some of your precious time listening to me today. My name is Logan Hart, and it is an honor to be invited to speak and present among so many legendary truth warriors. Let's give it up for the other amazing speakers who are sharing their wisdom at this amazing event here today. I can't hear you. I'm always blown away at the amount of dedication and care these people have for truth and freedom, and I am tremendously honored to be among them. And I love the feeling of my mind being expanded by all the profound knowledge and wisdom these events put forth. Again, my name is Logan Hart. I am the creator of the Wizard Factory channel, as well as Heartfire Visions, and I am a featured speaker on the One Great Work Network. So if you enjoy what I share with you here today, please feel free to go and follow me on my various platforms, especially Wizard Factory, as it's a lot more of this type of material. So today I will be presenting Breaking Beyond the Box from Dogma to Holistic Freedom. This presentation is intended to highlight a very specific aspect of the broader topic of mind control, a topic which I'm very passionate about illuminating. And for anyone interested, I recommend my presentation called Trivium Hacking on my YouTube channel and other video channels. But this presentation will be a focused expansion on a specific facet of this going into much greater depth and finishing with how we can liberate our minds to operate with a pure mindset with which to experience this magical thing we call life. Dogma is the greatest obstacle of true knowledge, morality, and spirituality. It is the scourge of consciousness, cancer of the mind, and the bane of our higher potential. So, a quick overview of what we're going to be covering here. The spiritual landscape. We will be defining dogma. We'll be covering the, some of the symbolism of the box. Looking at the source of all dogma. Looking at the big three, what I call the big three of dogmatic belief. We'll be expanding the box-free mindsets for holistic being and then the concept of breaking beyond the box. So again, we're going to spend some time looking at the negative, the dogmatic side, and then I will describe the positive alternative, the natural and free states of thinking, being, and exploring this reality free of those boxes. In the vast garden of human consciousness, imagine the mind as a delicate plant. It is a plant with boundless potential, equipped with roots that thirst for knowledge and branches reaching out for new perspectives from the light of truth. In its natural state, this plant thrives, absorbing wisdom from the rich soil of diverse experiences and basking in the sunlight of free thought. However, there exists a box, a narrow container representing dogmatic thinking. This box restricts the growth of the plant's roots, trapping them in a confined space. These roots, symbolic of one's beliefs and ideologies, can no longer explore the expansive garden of ideas. They become entangled within the limited space, root-bound and unable to connect with the greater tapestry of knowledge and understanding. The branches which should reach out to the skies of creativity and innovation are stunted within the box of dogma. They cannot flourish or stretch towards new horizons because of the confines of rigid thinking preventing their expansion. As this plant remains isolated within its box, it becomes disconnected from nature as a larger unified system. It loses touch with the intricate web of interconnected ideas, perspectives, and the ever-changing environment of human knowledge. It withers in the shadow of its full potential. We are all spiritual beings, as this is in our inherent nature and the nature of our existence and purpose here. 
Those who don't realize this are no less spiritual. They simply aren't conscious of it. For spirituality, just like consciousness, is a scale. It's all the same thing, only varying in degrees. This is the law of polarity. So just as darkness itself is not actually a thing, but merely the absence of light, ignorance is merely the absence of awareness. Shadows in the mind of the all. So what is spirituality? I think it's important to define terms uh, so that we, you as the listener know exactly what I mean when I'm using terms. So I define spiritual, spirituality as the transcendent personal exploration of one's self, purpose, and connection to something greater than oneself. The divine, universal consciousness, nature, and the cosmos. Inner and outer exploration. The microcosm and the macrocosm. This is done via the subjective incarnation of consciousness into a physical body with the capacity for sentience. Using this vessel, we actualize our universal cosmic purpose of expansion into higher conscious awareness through the ability to choose our actions and experiences and learn to grow through those experiences. As spiritual beings, having a clean and clear interface with the universe is not just important, it's everything. In order to fulfill this universal purpose, certain conditions must be present. Holistic freedom, right? We must have a mental, spiritual, and physical freedom in order to navigate by way of our thoughts, feelings, choices, and actions in order to create our personal experiences freely. This, this next part is extremely important. Freedom isn't just about the absence of imposed limitations and harm from external forces. This is essential, but it's only the base layer. Higher spiritual freedom is about liberation from ignorance, erroneous and false beliefs which objectively limit our ability to understand, navigate, and create reality. We must have a pure mindset and proper filters by which to accurately receive process and learn from those experiences a mind aligned with truth and natural law and this is the natural state of mind we are born with this and so you know that word natural will be a very recurring theme throughout this work so let's go ahead and define that now natural that which exists or occurs in the physical world as a result of natural processes without human intervention or artificial alteration, characteristic of the inherent qualities and behaviors of the natural world. So think of the mind of a child, eyes and mind wide open, ready to receive, full of curiosity and wonderment about the world. The simplest objects and feats seem like magic, no programs or indoctrination running, just pure experience met with a playful spirit and an eagerness to explore this seemingly endless playground of possibilities. So then, if we are born with this natural mindset, what are the obstacles and traps we get caught in along the way which confine, block, and distort our perception, cloud our ability to think and process, and stifle us from actualizing our best and most aware selves. Simply put, mind control. The annihilation of sovereignty, individuality, free will, and free thought. And the installation of programs, constructs, indoctrination, and false beliefs. Dogmatism. Which is what we're focusing on with this presentation. Your consciousness in a box. So, defining dogma. There are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. 
the others to refuse to believe what is true. Dogma refers to a set of axioms, principles, or beliefs that are adhered and rigidly clung to by an individual or group without being questioned or doubted. And sometimes, more often than you might think, people are part of invisible groups or organizations without even realizing it. This is the magic of mind control. A doctrine or tenet that is considered to be authoritative and indisputable within the context of that group or belief system, whether realized or unrealized. That's very important. Dogmas are of, often presented as absolute truths or fundamental principles that must be followed or adhered to without deviation. Dogmas are associated with religious, philosophical, or ideological beliefs. They can be established by religious institutions, political ideologies, cultural and societal norms, or even scientific communities. Mind control targets and caters to different psychological profiles, personality types, and social demographics. These programs then activate and exploit our social instincts and psychological traumas and aggregate those with certain beliefs or predispositions to those beliefs into collectivist mental frameworks. Dogmatism refers to the tendency of individuals or groups to adhere rigidly to their beliefs, rejecting contradictory evidence or differing viewpoints. This can lead to closed-mindedness and an unwillingness to consider new information or change one's beliefs when presented with compelling evidence. The result is a severe limitation of individual critical thinking and openness to alternative perspectives. The whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves and wiser people so full of doubts. So cognitive dissonance is a psychological phenomenon that occurs when an individual holds contradictory beliefs, attitudes, or values. This inconsistency creates a sense of discomfort and psychological tension. To reduce this discomfort, Individuals may try to resolve the dissonance by changing their beliefs, avoiding acknowledgement, modifying their behaviors, or rationalizing their attitudes. So this may show up as ignorance and avoidance, right? Uh, individuals with dogmatic beliefs may experience cognitive dissonance when they encounter information that challenges or conflicts with their previous, their current held beliefs. And then to avoid the discomfort of this dissonance, they might actively avoid situations, people, or information that could, could trigger conflicting thoughts or this, this uh, uncomfortable feeling. Rationalization and minimization. When faced with uh, cognitive dissonance, individuals may rationalize or minimize the conflicting information. They might reinterpret evidence to fit within their existing belief system, downplay the importance of conflicting information, or convince themselves that the dissonance isn't significant. With the confirmation bias, uh, the individual may have selective awareness and an acknowledgement on different information. They will seek out information which supports and confirms their beliefs while ignoring or denying that which conflicts with them. Socially, this manifests as an echo chamber where people will surround themselves with people who share similar beliefs and avoid those with differing beliefs. Uh, in some cases, they might adopt a form of double think, a term coined by George Orwell in the book 1984. This re refers to holding two contradictory beliefs sim simultaneously while accepting both as true. This mental compartmentalization can alleviate cognitive dissonance, allowing individuals to continue believing in dogma without directly confronting conflicting evidence or the discrepancy within their minds. Individuals will often have a strong attachment to a certain idea or axiom, a trauma bond which supports or corroborates a deeper wounded core belief that a person holds about themselves, the world, or both. This is why dogma can be so sticky, right? It goes beyond the, the 
belief at face value into the depths of the subconscious mind and they're you're dealing with their very sense of self these are very deep-seated beliefs and they're they're not going to be taken well when that is challenged the discomfort of cognitive dissonance can also drive individuals to either reject the conflicting information or find ways to reconcile it with their dogmatic beliefs further reinforcing the dogma itself when pressed on the contradictions the individual will often double down on their belief digging in deeper rather than acknowledging and confronting the fallacy people often re react the same way to challenging their beliefs and identities as an addiction or vice because psychologically they're the same they've trauma bonded to a belief or idea that somehow validates or protects an underlying wound and fills the void left in its wake much like an addict will will use a, you know a chemical or a gambling or something like that to to fill this uh, internal psychological wound so let's look at the purpose of dogma dogma is one of the fundamental hallmarks of any cult leaders and teachers within the cult are usually well aware of its true purpose to stifle free and critical thinking and open inquiry and to foster obedience and indoctrination to serve the agenda of the organization on a mass scale the organization being the entire global slave system the control matrix with the agenda being the suppression of consciousness and the domination of free will in order to serve the master class of social engineers to me one of the fascinating aspects about cults is it can be quite difficult to tell who is actually aware that it's all bs that it's lies and manipulation and is constantly peddling it for power and who is themselves drinking the kool-aid and are just as duped as their followers but ultimately the result is the same everyone ends up kind of being victimized by it Travis Walton said, I've come to realize that the biggest problem anywhere in the world is that people's perceptions of reality are compulsively filtered through the screening mesh of what they want and do not want to be true. Very, very powerful statement. Dogmatic beliefs first originate from the upper hierarchies of the institutions in order to serve their purpose. They are then perpetuated by its adherence via trauma bonding. This occurs when an individual becomes deeply identified with a particular belief system because that identity gives them a sense of power, belonging, and wholeness that they were lacking within themselves due to some psychological exploits which the cult is preying upon. Therefore, when a new idea, fact, or anecdote changes the narrative, it is rejected often with hostility because not only does it threaten the person's beliefs but their very identity and internal source of power and is therefore interpreted as a direct personal attack upon them so in the interest of the institutions or organizations which deliberately exploit dogmatic thinking it serves several distinct functions to that organization Dogmatic thinking provides a shared vision and purpose for the cult, aligning members' actions and ef efforts towards common goals. This unity allows the group to pursue its agenda more effectively. By controlling what someone thinks, you subsequently control what they feel and care about and therefore how they act, which again, I go into much greater depth in my presentation trivium hacking so i definitely recommend checking that out cults use dogma to establish a rigid belief system that discourages questioning or dissent this control ensures that members stay devoted to the ideology and are less likely to challenge the authority or leave the group dogmatic thinking promotes a shared set of beliefs and values within the cult leading to a strong sense of group identity and belonging amongst its members this is uh you know the the dynamic of collectivism 
This cohesion can create a tightly knit community that is resistant to external influences. And the certainty and absoluteness of dogmatic beliefs can attract individuals seeking clarity, purpose, and answers. This is particularly effective and predatory upon people who feel lost, bro alone, broken, and confused. You know, you see these, uh, these billboards all over the place, you know, like the, uh, the four truth, you know, the, the Christian billboards. It's always some guy with like his head buried in his hands and he's just desperate. And it's just like, are you in despair? Jesus is your hope. You know, Jesus will solve all your problems. This is just one example of the predatory nature of cults. It's looking to target broken and hopeless people that will cling to that false light like, you know, like a moth to flame. And finally, dogmatic thinking can re reinforce the cult's hierarchical structure where leaders hold absolutely uh, absolute authority of truth and dictate all aspects of the members' lives. So dogmatic thinking has several universal techniques methods and hallmarks so once you become familiar with these dogmatic beliefs can be much easier to recognize that is if you're actually paying attention if you're actually being honest with yourself now uh, we will get into what i call the big three later some of you may already be familiar with this concept of mine but I, uh, the big three are known as statism religion and culture these are the biggest three boxes for the mind the biggest three dogmatic belief systems now keep these all in mind as i move through each one of these individually religion government and culture okay monopoly on truth discouragement of questioning fear of punishment shame and guilt intellectual suppression limited access to information thought-stopping techniques, appeal to authority, groupthink and conformity, emotional manipulation, black and white thinking, this is a big one, isolation from outsiders, selective use of scripture or text, censorship, demonization of outsiders, us and them mentality, control over language, and finally, rewards for conformity. So this, I'm sure something in here will sound very familiar to you. If you criticize Trump, they'll assume, oh, you must be a Hillary supporter. Criticize religion, and they assume you're an atheist. Criticize government, they assume you just want chaos. Express yourself authentically, and they'll say you just want attention. Speak truth, and they'll say you don't respect other people's beliefs, or that you must want to be some kind of guru. Refuse to wear a mask or give up your guns. And they'll say, you must want people to die. Criticize bad behavior, and they call you a racist, sexist, bigot. These are all examples of the polarized thinking and lack of critical thinking skills when you're dealing with a blockhead. So with that term, blockhead, uh, that's a, a nice segue into this next section where we're going to look at some of the actual symbolism of the box. So we're looking at anything, th these are all tied together. Uh, and think of it going from, uh, you know, single dimensional to sec two, di two dimensional, three dimensional, and so forth. So you've got the line, you know, which forms a square, was two dimensional. Uh, and then the cube becomes 3D, as well as a box, a block, a brick, and even uh, the, the hypercube or the tesseract, which even goes into the 4D. So what is this symbol? If you look at this all as kind of one package, what does this represent? It represents suppression, closed-mindedness, stagnation, materialism, conformity, confinement, separation, repression, rigidity, slavery, death, borders, boundaries, and order. So you could look at this as the left brain programming, the masculine side of the brain imbalance, where you're stuck in that. 
this is bypassing holistic intelligence where where you're using both hemispheres of the brain so you're going to be stuck in these left brain modalities here and cut off from the right brain uh which is why you won't have holistic intelligence right these over here are are forms of intelligence but until you can combine them together your mind your mental cognitive capacity will be severely uh, limited and stunted so think of the left brain and the right brain the masculine and feminine as the forest versus the trees right left brain is specific right individual trees it's it's about splitting hairs and cutting things apart and breaking them down and looking at the individual parts and then the right brain is about seeing the bigger patterns putting that all back together right if you have you have a group of trees it becomes a forest if you're only in left brain intelligence you literally cannot see the forest which is ironic we're talking about symbolism here so if you're a blockhead if you're in a left brain modality you cannot actually extrapolate these these um these patterns uh you can't understand you can't correlate uh allegory to the literal and that's going to be very important when we get into the later uh sections of this presentation where i'm talking about paganism and animism as a mindset so without that collaborative thought process you cannot think creatively or formulate new ideas your pattern recognition ability is severely impaired like a computer that only knows how to follow the commands of the code running it so getting into some of the dangers of this box mindset conformity one of the biggest pitfalls with mental boxes is the aspect of conformity and labels a box is a container it contains it limits what do you do with a container you slap a label on it be very cautious of labeling yourself and your beliefs words and language have a profound impact on how you think christian muslim democrat republican feminist communist putting yourself in a box even if you don't 100 percent agree with every stance within this if you're going to label yourself but then say you make your own rules then why even bother with the label why put yourself in that box just stay free labels give people a false sense of security making them feel like they're tethered to something to some path or belief system that is validated preordained true by consensus which is a fallacy every single person could believe in something and it would still be false it feels much more comfortable to cling to an idea or system that's identified formalized and socially validated following the beaten path and then try to pigeonhole their own individuality within the confines of that box rather than being untethered and forging your own path the law right man's law the bible the quran etc are centralized and monolithic definitive authority there's no centralized authority on how to be pagan say for example hundreds of different cultures have done it differently throughout history freedom or anarchy has no such thing there is no right way to freedom so long as freedom is actually present right you could try to point to the constitution but that's missing the point anyway that is creating a monolithic uh source of freedom but freedom doesn't come from a document it doesn't come from a book freedom is based on moral principles that are based in truth they are inherent to nature based in truth and self-evident right you could create a law that states the sun the sun shall rise tomorrow it's meaningless it doesn't make anything true or untrue right you could you could create another uh document that declares gravity to be nullified right the gravity is is no longer a law what good would that do right or say let's let's all make murder legal does that actually make it okay does it make it moral 
absolutely not. And ultimately, programming and indoctrination is a false proxy for direct experience. A proxy is a person, thing, or entity that is used as a stand-in or a replacement for something authentic, genuine, or legitimate. So it's literally like slipping a VR headset over your eyes without you knowing it and let you go on thinking you're having a direct, real experience, right? Direct interface with reality. The Matrix is actually very real, it, but it doesn't live inside a computer. It lives in your mind, in your consciousness. Your, it's your false belief system. So the box is the program. Imaginary borders of thought constructed to contain and suppress your consciousness. Stagnant, static belief. Not dynamic, but static. And often rife with false dialectics, polarized ideas, and rigid dogmatic belief. It's also important to note that the cube or the square is not an inherently evil or negative symbol. It represents the divine masculine. It must be balanced with the feminine or it will become a cage. In esoteric astrology and occult traditions, Saturn can be linked to the concept of limitation and control. The cube or square is seen as an expression of Saturn's restrictive and confining influence. Saturn's role as the taskmaster is associated with karmic lessons and the challenges that can inhibit or catalyze, that's very important, personal growth and self-awareness. The square is sometimes connected to Saturn's role as the Lord of Time, emphasizing the notion of being trapped or confined within the boundaries of linear time and limited perspectives. Again, many may think of Saturn as a malefic planet, but I fully disagree with this. Saturn represents karma and natural law, the pressure that creates diamonds. This can be the source of your greatest lessons. So we can see the box symbolism in many common phrases that really kind of iterate this, these, uh, these concepts that are tied to this symbol that we've been talking about. So to think outside the box, clearly, uh, that's self-explanatory. Uh, don't be a square means, you know, don't be, uh, don't be no fun, right? A stick in the mud. It's kind of like saying that. It's like, um, you know, a square is somebody that's very uptight, you know? They can't let loose. They can't have fun. Blockhead. Uh, so if you have mental blockage or if you have writer's block, there's that cutting off from your creativity. Um... If we're square, that means we're even or we're tied. Think about it. Tied. We're tied. We're bound up. Cornered. If you're feeling cornered, right, you feel trapped. You feel confined. Same as if you're boxed in, right? Um, a stumbling block. There's is more of this kind of uh, inhibition. And if you've been around the block... That means you're actually experienced, right? You've gotten some real world knowledge. You're around the block. And if you're back to square one, you're, you're, you're thwarted from forward progress, right? You're brought right back to square one. Again, I'm going to point out that the cube is not inherently negative or malefic. Ironically, this would be a black and white dogmatic way of thinking of it. It's like the square is bad, the circle is good, right? It's about imbalance and the exploitation of the law of polarity and gender. So in this case, you see the cube and the sphere. This is, again, the masculine and the feminine principle. But before we get into the three-dimensional, let's take it back to the line, the square you know, and then the cube, 1D, 2D, 3D, uh, with the line is the same kind of thing, right? Where you draw the line, that's where it stops, right? And then when you've crossed the line, that's your boundary. Reading between the lines, right? That's using your right brain, holistic intelligence. If someone tells you to get in line, that's like telling you get on the square, 
right? Get in line, fall in line, conform, obey, do what you're told. And then if you have a deadline, there's that death aspect. The deadline is like, this is where it ends, right? You, you're, you're confined by this deadline. You have to uh, get stuff done in time. It's also that time aspect as well of Saturn. So moving back to the cube and sphere, again, the cube is masculine, the sphere is feminine. And together, you know, that creates the holistic intelligence. So looking for a moment uh, into some Masonic symbolism, first you have the square and compass, right? These two go together. The square is the ruler, right? The ruler like Saturn, the the right angle there's that's the karma natural law and then the compass it draws the circle so that's the masculine and the feminine aspects and together you have the g the generative principle this is what literally creates life when the masculine and feminine come together this creates life this is the secret formula or force of creation in the universe and then over here on the right, you have the Masonic tracing board where you're moving from the square, which is base consciousness, right? It is uh, the blockhead up to the celestial orbs, which are circular. All right. So now taking this idea of the checkerboard, and here is an amazing piece of art by Nate Cap, who is another presenter here. Uh, who's also a very talented artist, and this is called Floor Eyed, which is a very clever name as well. So you can see the pillars are broken, right? There's no polarity, pillarity. And uh, y the third eye is asleep. It's complacent. Uh, everything is, the kingdom is in shambles, right? This is, the again, the base consciousness and the black and white thinking. Now taking this checkerboard, and uh, we look at the British law enforcement. Not only do they use this all over the place, they literally put it on their heads, right on their third eye. Proudly, yet ignorantly, displaying for the whole world that they are a blockhead, that they are in base consciousness because they're mindless order followers. They do not have their consciousness truly online to exercise true morality, true conscience. Then you have the jack in the box, which, you know, what is the jack in the box? He's a clown. He's a fool. You also see this in the fool card, is the, the jester archetype mindlessly walking off of a cliff, right? And the jack is... He's in the box, right? You get him wound up, and he pops out, right? And, of course, they use this in marketing, you know? Uh, if you eat food that looks like this, you're probably a jack-in-the-box. You're probably very low consciousness. More uh, cases here. You have uh, a homeless person, a hobo, that lives in a box, right? The derelict of society, someone with no purpose. Penalty box, right? When you're bad, when you do do something bad, they put you in the naughty box, right? And then and you can't play the game, right? You're limited, you're stifled. And of course the Skinner box, which is a, a device for basically uh controlling people's behavior or you know it's it's testing for animals but B.F. Skinner was uh, one of the godfathers of mind, modern mind control, basically, and he used this device to figure out these techniques that they then eventually will use on humans. One of my personal favorites, the block button, right? There's your boundary. You block them, they're, you know, banished from your space. Then with, uh, with the TV, or you can look at phones as well, you've got the black mirror, the box, right? The cable box, the box office where you go and, you know, buy your movies, which is all mind control devices. 
in religion you have the Kaaba uh, in Mecca. This is a Islamic symbol and a uh, a holy place, which is a giant black cube of Saturn. The shell rosh is a form of Tefillin in the uh, Ju- Judaic tradition, where they literally put a, a black box full of scriptures written on them right over their third eye. And of course, you've got all of these different uh, cubes, statues, uh, structures throughout the world, Australia, Denmark, Manhattan. And then taking back from the, cu- the curve to the line, you've got globe earth versus flat earth which is very interesting right the sphere is feminine as we've talked about earlier the earth is the mother so to flatten the curve as they love to say is to disrespect and disgrace the divine feminine also where where else have we heard this phrase flatten the curve then you have the the tesseract as i said is the four-dimensional cube the known as the hypercube and uh, this can be seen from a certain perspective as a um, an octagon. So when you see this eight-sided octagon shape, that is also another version of this same symbol that we're that we're looking at here. So where do you see the octagon? The UFC. So you get in the octagon, or you get in the boxing ring to see how many rounds you can go. Right? Which, ironically, the boxing ring is a square, too. Uh, And what are you trying to do? You're trying to punch his lights out, right? Knock him unconscious or knock his block off. Or maybe you want to try to block your opponent's punches. Every time you see a stop sign, you're getting subliminal messaging telling you, you know, stop right? Inhibition, blockage. And also you in the eight-pointed police cap, which is again putting this hypercube symbolism right, right on the head. So let's take a day in the life of a modern human. You wake up, your, your rectangular phone is going off, and you uh you get up out of your rectangular bed you go ahead and pack your lunch box right your little square sandwiches so you can get three square meals a day you live in your your uh, square house which is ironic you know the pagan huts and yurts back in you know in the ancient times all living spaces teepees they were all round uh, you get in your car, maybe you drive a uh, Nissan Cube or something, and then you drive through the city blocks, however many blocks to get to the town square, uh, so that you can go to your job and you sit in a cubicle, uh, which is a form of basically a stall, right? Where does what is a stall? Somewhere you keep animals, right? Livestock. Uh, what does stall also mean? To to come to a standstill, right? Your engine stalls out, and um, and you spend your life trying to 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 not go to jail, right? To go into a jail cell, which is the ultimate symbol of confinement. And you got to make sure you you know you pay your electric bill uh, to keep the power grid online. Grid is another form of the the cube matrix, right? Uh, unless you want to eventually try to go off grid, right? Or think about the word gridlock is another right stoppage blockage until eventually you end up in a box, right? The coffin. This is a, a a spiritual death. You can see here through the allegory, uh, the the Masonic allegory of Hiram Abiff, where you know uh, his his consciousness, or you know he represents consciousness, is put to death by the three ruffians, which are ignorance, apathy, and cowardice. This is the 
the antithetical to the Holy Trinity. Thoughts, emotions, and actions, right? The ignorance is the death of your intelligence. The apathy is the death of your care. And cowardice is the death of your will. This is total spiritual death. And so, there's, uh, looking at that, you're putting your consciousness on the chopping block, right? The Grim Reaper, which is Saturn. And black, by the way, is uh, associated, that's why it's a black cube, uh, also associated with Saturn. So this is why a judge wears black robes, because he is the, you know, the arbiter, right? The, uh, the judge, natural law. And then carrying this concept forward with the block, the, the Saturn uh, being a, a symbol of death, when you go to a ballot box, and you put your free will to death by putting your vote in a, in, a, in a coffin, in a box, right? And then you get a little sticker. Also, the pyramid is composed of blocks, right? You have to have every unit created the, the same so you can stack it and create the the system of control, the pyramid, right, that's on the dollar bill. This is conformity, right? Everyone's the same, building up the structure of control. And, uh, you know, and here we have the mortar board, which is another square on the head. They, they love those, don't they? And what is a mortar board? But a way to build, you, you, you're using the mortar to stack the bricks in the wall, right? Until this covers up the light of truth, the light of consciousness, and blocks it out. It blocks it out. So quickly, let's go through the source of all dogma. Where does it actually come out of? The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. So when we're looking, this section is all about how they fill the mind as, as a vessel. Mind control via the trivium is primarily perpetrated via the control of information. Information dictates thought, which dictates emotion and care, which dictates actions. So you control the information, you control the mind. This is primarily, uh, it is primarily by way of this highly controlled and carefully crafted information matrix that constructs the mental boxes which entraps the consciousness of the global population. Remember that the primary function of these indivisible cults is to act as an external authority and false proxy for truth and first-hand experience. The majority of all information which is disseminated to the masses comes from only a handful of sources, nearly all of which are highly centralized, monopolized, and controlled. When information is published or mass distributed in some way, it automatically gives the illusion of being more trustworthy and legitimate. This dynamic is absolutely exploited by these media outlets. All truth comes directly from nature. So all dogma comes from this false information matrix to con you into believing it over your own direct experiences. Pay no attention to what's right in front of you. We will tell you all you need to know about truth. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. Now, on the topic of sources of information, the fear or dismissal of the occult is easily one of the most damaging and limiting dogmatic beliefs. Assuming that it is either inherently evil, contains nothing of value, or superstitious nonsense, keeps the vast majority of people from ever even looking into it, while ironically holding these strong opinions around it despite their own willful and proud ignorance. The occult, in a nutshell, is the hidden knowledge of human and cosmic psychology, human behavior, cosmic law, 
and the dynamics of achieving true freedom, I would only ask this one question. Who would these dogmatic beliefs, causing most people to ignore the totality of this information, most benefit? This next slide is extremely important. The only true source of knowledge is nature, via personal gnosis. The only way to truly know something is to test, verify, or experience it for yourself in the great laboratory called reality. Religion, or even pseudo-spirituality, will make many claims about things that cannot be verified, pertaining to claims beyond the realm of observation, and expecting you to simply accept them as truth on blind faith alone. Science may apply to the physical realm, but only be testable using equipment or technology that only selective labs or organizations have access to, such as space travel, special microscopes, particle accelerators, things like this, making it very difficult for the average normal person to actually test the theories that they're putting out there as, as proven fact. Now with this, I'm also, I'm not ignoring the intuitive inner knowing, but even that still needs to be verified in some way eventually. It's important to listen to that, to be in tune and in touch with that, but if it's not practical, then what good is it? If you can't actually test it, then you don't truly know that you know. So now we get to the big three that I've been sort of alluding to. I call these the big three because they are by far the three largest and most widespread mental boxes in the world, with at least one affecting nearly every person. And put together, they are suppressing and confining the consciousness of most people on the planet to some degree or another, with the majority being hopelessly lost within all three and even more. The unholy trinity of mind control. They are religion, statism, and culture. And all three are based in the concept of some form of false external authority. Each of these are a box for the mind, body, and spirit, respectively. And part of the PSYOP is compartmentalizing these, mind, body, and spirit, and treating them as separate. This keeps people fragmented and misaligned internally and their consciousness in a state of confusion and discord. The enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. John F. Kennedy So religion is the belief in authority of a false god, scripture, and the church, or papacy, over you. It is dominion over your spirit, or soul, that is the soul box of your holy trinity, which is mind, body, and spirit. This is the, the spirit box, right? Great band, by the way. Um, authority is backed by coercion, okay, through religion, via plagues, curses, damnation, and hellfire, things of this nature, these, these threats of, of punishment and harm. This includes cultural religions like Christianity, Islam, doesn't matter. But it also, uh, I'm putting scientism and atheism into this box. So the purpose of religion is to give you an artificial and false spiritual construct for the nature of your existence, your purpose, and how reality works. So, you know, science can just as much be this. It's giving you a worldview, like the grand macro uh, framework. Freedom of thought is the only guarantee against an infection of people by mass myths, which in the hands of treacherous hypocrites and demagogues can be transformed into bloody dictatorships. Now we get to statism. Statism is the belief in authority of government over you and its necessity in order to organize society, maintain order, and protect human rights, when in fact, they are the biggest violators of rights by far. They 
exercise dominion over your body. It's your body box. And your authority is also backed by coercion and physical violence via taxation, fines, uh, police, jail, right? You must understand that it's not the left versus the right. This is another box. It's the state versus you. It's not Democrats versus Republicans. It's tyranny versus freedom. Statism is based on the fictitious belief that some individuals possess special rights that others do not possess. That some have the magical right to extort, coerce, counterfeit, assault, kidnap, and even murder, and everyone else will be criminalized for doing the same. That some have the right to create laws, while everyone else has an obligation to follow them. Statism gives you the illusion that rights and freedom come from government and that violence and coercion is the only viable means for getting things done and maintaining order in society. But only government has that right, not you. So it creates a master class and therefore by default a slave class. The scam of this is that all power that government has comes from the people. Yet, they've convinced us that the people must give this power away for democracy to work. If the people already have all the power, then why do we need to give that power away in order to be free? The purpose of statism is to give you a false idea of how society should be structured and organized, usually as an extension of whatever religious worldview is held as well. Ultimately, the purpose of statism is to legitimize and legalize slavery. Culture is not your friend. Culture is for other people's convenience and the convenience of various institutions, churches, companies, tax collection schemes, what have you. It is not your friend. It insults you. It disempowers you. It uses and abuses you. None of us are well treated by culture. It invites people to diminish themselves and dehumanize themselves by behaving like machines. Terence McKenna. So with culture, it is the belief in authority of society or consensus over you. It claims dominion over your mind, your sense of self, and society. Its authority is backed by coercion via judgment, bullying, ostracization, shaming and mob rule it is rooted in collectivism and conformity and is is another form of social engineering and it's all rooted in the lie of the greater good right where the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the individual or the rights of the individual the purpose of culture as mind control is to socially condition you into adopting certain beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors which align to the control system. This is popularity, norms, fads, peer pressure, taboos, traditions, and social expectations. Most people are not even aware of their need to conform. They live under the illusion that they follow their own ideas and inclinations, that they are individualists, that they have arrived at their opinions as a result of their own thinking, and that it just happens that their ideas are the same as those of the majority. So to reiterate, culture is there to shape your views about yourself and social dynamics. Politics is there to shape your beliefs about how society should be structured, regulated, and organized to maintain order. And religion gives you a false existential worldview of the universe and your place in it. It is the mental, physical, and spiritual mind control. And you can see the hierarchical nature of these structures as each an extension of the next. It kind of starts with religion. The state is a product of that religious framework. And then culture is kind of a com combination of all of those. All three teach you that fundamental and ultimate truth comes from authority via religion government and society and not the individual nor nature or and reality it is systemic gaslighting designed to get you to trust external ex authority of what is right and true above your own senses and rationality
And we'll look at a few more dogmatic programs that are the main, besides the big three, these are kind of like the main ones that people can become very, very dogmatic about. False identity constructs. So isms can create schisms that become prisons, right? So all these isms that people uh, get really tied up in can really create a lot of division and discord. Remember that behavior is aligned with identity. So having a strict and artificial conception of self restricts free will expression, self-exploration, imagination, and creativity. Social narratives like racism, sexism, climate change, environmentalism. These are things that people become very, very dogmatic about. Uh, education, clearly. Uh, money. You know, money can, can go go both ways. Either money is the root of all evil, and you know, only uh, only the, the poor, ragged person has any hope of being truly spiritual and and enlightened. Right? If you if you want money whatsoever, if you try to actually develop wealth in your lower consciousness or something, or you are consumed with greed. You're obsessed with money. You'll do anything for money. You'll sell your soul and your morals for money. Both of these are dogmatic imbalances. Uh, parenting styles, obviously. C people can be very dogmatic about morality and ethics. Uh, health and lifestyle, right? What diet to eat. You know, what type of uh, medicine you should take. How to be healthy. And, you know, technology, right? Uh, you know, Apple or Android, you know, things like this. Uh, or even just technology is all bad. We need to go back and just, just live, uh, live like primitively, things like this. You know, there's so many different ways uh, people can, can get, go this way or that and become very, very dogmatic with things. All right, so this next section is, uh, is a fun one. Don't do the psy hop. Okay, there are psyops for every layer and stage of consciousness. They've already mapped out the entire human mind and designed programs for everyone, for every psychological profile. So you might think you're waking up, but actually you're just hopping from one box to the next along a spectrum, psyop to psyop. You're doing the psyop. So here's just one example of this. You know, you go from statism, right? Government is good and necessary and we trust the government, right? To, well, I don't know, uh, we really need to, you know, limited government. The government's way too big. We got to just have a, a constitutional republic, the minarchist pr perspective, right? It's closer to truth, but it's still, it's just another cul-de-sac to keep you trapped and stuck. Uh, and then and then you go to QAnon, right? You get even more down the conspiracy rabbit hole of, uh, you know, it's kind of the middle ground where, you know, clearly things are wrong, but we've got this, this insider information coming in and uh, we don't have to do anything because the White Hats got it, right? They're going to they're gonna fix everything. Okay, that didn't work out. Now we're full-blown conspiracy. You know, they're turning the freaking frogs, frogs gay. Uh, uh, but, you know, then, uh, uh, as you know, Alex Jones is very pro-Trump. You know, Trump's going to drain the swamp. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's another limited, it's closer to truth. There's a lot of truth in it and mixed in it, but it's not a real solution. It's not actually going to create any change. And that's the point of a PSYOP, is to give you a little taste of truth because you know something's wrong. But then it it doesn't actually fix the problem, and then of course you go you go full blown conspiracy. You you're a flat earther now, right? So you've went from d being a government worshiping statist to a flat earther. It's a whole spectrum where you're like, oh, government's totally evil. That part you're on a good timeline, a good trajectory, but you're getting confused and diverted from a true actual path that leads to true solutions. So don't do the psy hop. And you know what? To be fair, I think everybody kind of does this to some degree. You know, I was raised statist. I was raised Christian. And I went through phases where I thought, oh, the occult is all evil, um, you know, or, or new age is like true spirituality. And these, 
while these are psyops and control, you know, cul-de-sacs, uh, they are stepping stones towards truth. So the main key, key takeaway here is, you know, change your mind, but continue to move closer to truth. Don't get stuck in these false boxes. I think it's very important to acknowledge why people seek out and cling to belief systems so tightly. Freedom is extremely terrifying to most people. They've been conditioned beyond belief to simply follow and obey. Free thought and critical thinking have been radically suppressed in the collective consciousness. Due to programming, ultimately people just want to be told what to think and what to do. The stress and responsibility of figuring out everything on their own is just too much. The bottom line is that most people are in spiritual infancy. I mean, they haven't even been born yet. So sometimes when freedom is overwhelming and you're just trying to learn, having a system and a script to follow can actually be very useful. It's like having training wheels on a bike. But eventually it becomes a crutch. Eventually it becomes a box. Eventually you must take the training wheels off and learn to balance all by yourself to form your own thoughts and beliefs, values and principles. Think of it as the stages of growing up. Children need firm rules and structure because they have such a limited understanding of the world. When they reach adolescence, they become defiant, resentful, and angsty of the teachings because they're ready for autonomy. They've, they're, uh, they're feeling restricted and stifled by all the rules. But then when they fully mature into their spiritual adulthood, perhaps they'll come back full circle and realize that maybe some of the teachings and rules were for good reasons and others not so much. They'll have tested and felt out what works and what doesn't and come to their own direct understanding. So we've basically covered the dogmatic side of things and, and really defined and explored the, the dogmatic mindset, right? So what is the alternative? What are we going to replace that with? Where are we going to go when we get outside the box? So we're going to look at the box-free mindsets for holistic being. So... We're going to go through these individually and, and unpack them further. But a quick overview, you have to put truth first. You have to have true principles to navigate. You have to adopt open-mindedness as well as discernment because those two things have to go together. You have the alternative mindsets to the big three, which is anarchism, animism, and individualism and then tie that all together through what's called syncretism. So let's go through these one by one. Dogma is the antithesis of truth. So long as dogma is present in the mind, truth cannot dwell there. All dogma must be shed for the mind to become free and allow truth to enter. Truth must be held as the highest authority. If not, all other ideas and principles completely break down. It is the foundation upon all other knowledge is built. Truth must be held as more important than your beliefs, your feelings, your preferences, or any other subjective notions that may conflict with truth. Truth first, then everything else follows. Truth is supreme. This hierarchy must be in place. So when you're looking at truth discovery, you have to put experience first, then form your conclusions around that. Most people have it totally backwards. They have their conclusions first via the indoctrination that they've been uh, installed, they've been uh, filled with, and then either look for experience to validate that via confirmation bias, or simply just take it on faith alone, blind faith, and outright ignore and deny conflicting evidence. We are born with this natural, experience-based mindset, with our minds like a sponge, a never-ending flow of questions and curiosity, exploration and experimentation. But over the early years, it becomes overridden with indoctrination and programming. This order becomes inverted. Information must pass through many layers of your consciousness before fully being processed and determine what to do with it. 
So f you have first the pure input, the experience itself, and then it's going to go through your biological filters, the social and cultural conditioning, language and semantics, mental models, beliefs, biases, emotional filters, your traumas and past experiences, and your identity. So that, that input, that experience is going to bounce off of all of those things and get filtered through before you actually come to your analysis, your conclusion about that experience. And most of this is all very just automatic. It's subconscious and unconsciously done. So this is why self-awareness is very important. And also having each layer of that be pure and aligned to truth right your filter is working it's not allowing impurities and filth to come through so again truth is the only true authority right think of that word authority what is authoring reality truth is authoring reality we get to interact with reality and create different situations but Truth is what it is. Truth does not bend to your whims, your preferences, or f fallacies. It is what it is, has been, and always will be. Truth and natural law are not dogmatic. They're just consistent. Oftentimes, people will confuse truth for dogma because truth doesn't change. So if you possess true knowledge, you might seem rigid. But it's not you being rigid, it's truth itself. And this is where things can get tricky. Dogmatic thinking is so stubborn because it is held as absolute truth. This is why true discernment and critical thinking is so vital. Without it, one will become lost in endless epistemological cul-de-sacs. There is no religion higher than truth. Even truth can be turned into a dogmatic belief if a person clings so tightly to an axiom or belief that they become rigid and unable to account for nuance, exceptions, and gradients. This is that black and white mindset we were talking about. And when someone has been raised in programming rather than truth their whole life, until they heal and integrate, they will carry that mindset into any new paradigms they moved into. This is the difference between knowledge and understanding. And when looking at objective versus subjective, the experience is not truth itself. It is the experience of truth. That's what you are experiencing. So there, they must be two separate things. There's the experience, and then there's the truth that you are experiencing. So there's no such thing as my truth, your truth, etc., there is my experience, my opinion, my perception, my belief. The truth is the truth. It just is. No one owns it. There's only one. There's not all these different truths that everybody has a different one. This is the dangers of conflating all of these terms, which I hear all the time, and it drives me nuts because it literally is creating so much confusion. The words you use create the mental models that you're operating on. So when you are not distinguishing the difference between perception and reality, you won't be able to tell the difference. And suddenly you're lost in your own fantasies. And you're expecting truth to just be whatever you want it to be, or whatever you think it is, or whatever. So that's why truth must be first, and you must always be seeking to align your perception to be as close to truth as possible. So let's go ahead and get into the essential principles of freedom. It's essential to note that these are not belief systems. They are simple ideas which are based on fundamental principles. A principle is not a path. These are very two different things. A path tells you where to go. It's already walked by many before you. It's something you follow. Principles are more like your lantern. You use it to guide and illuminate as you find and navigate your own way through the darkness of ignorance towards truth and actualization. This is freedom. Following a path is exactly that. It's following. It's safe. 
the known, or at least that's what they tell you, it's known. You can navigate by following a path or by using the Lantern of Truth, Natural Law and Principles. The Lantern doesn't tell you where to go. It's illuminating and informing your direction, allowing you to avoid pitfalls and cliffs, trusting yourself rather than the path because that path could lead you straight off a cliff. Following a path tells you exactly what to do and what to think, just the same as everyone else who follows it. It removes your ability to discover, to come to your own conclusions. Everything is just prepackaged and fed to you. Following the light of principles allows you to bring that wisdom wherever you go. They show you how to think rather than telling you what to think. One thing to note is while I have used terms or labels to describe these things, there is one key difference. All of these terms refer to an approach which inherently entails forging your own personal path to truth. They are fundamentally anti-conformity, non-collectivist, and do not externalize authority, self-reliant, and autonomous. Now, while labels can be dangerous, some are very useful for basic communication of ideas, for understanding concepts. Even the word label is a label. All words are labels which communicate ideas and concepts. Words can be flawed, clunky, and fall short of the essence of an idea, but this is the nature of subjectivity. They are meant to merely be a pointer towards your own discovery. Mental models are essential to efficient truth discovery. The key factor is whether that model is testable in the real world and to not become too rigid and dogmatic with them. All constructs have their limitations. This is why personal gnosis is so fundamentally important. Um, it's been said that all models are wrong, some are useful. So that's, that's one way you can kind of look at this idea of concepts. So let's look at, you know, let's explore freedom, consciousness beyond the box. Freedom means not contained, unconfined. Holistic freedom includes physical as well as mental and spiritual freedom. The only limitations are the bounds of natural law and the finality of present and past reality. The only box is natural law. We are confined by karma and the consequences of our choices, cause and effect. There is no escaping this box, but to even want to do so is insanity, for natural law is the only thing that gives order, consistency, and rationality to reality and makes freedom possible. Just like we discussed Saturn earlier, meaning natural law, it's not a negative thing. It's actually there for your benefit to evolve. A paradox, but this box is actually freedom so to achieve freedom you must first know and then meet the requirements so we will look at first physical freedom and then mental freedom so the principles of physical freedom are first principles themselves the first and primary requirement of freedom is a set of reasonable truth-based principles to guide choices and behavior morality and ethics are fundamental to a free society based on the non-aggression and self-defense principles and a framework rooted in natural law individual sovereignty no masters no slaves all are equal in rights under natural law individually to autonomy True freedom respects and upholds individual autonomy, which means self-governance. It recognizes that individuals have the right to make choices for themselves as long as those choices do not infringe upon the rights and freedoms of others. Autonomy allows individuals to lead their lives according to their own values and beliefs. And with this must come personal responsibility. If you are self-governing, then you are responsible for how you think, what you do, 
right? You, there are no middlemen, there are no intermediaries, and there are no saviors. You are completely on your own. There is no higher authority than the individual unless that authority is given consensually or rightful via property. And there is no codependence because if you're codependent, then you are not truly free. The next principle and requirement for physical freedom is knowing and defending your rights. A right is any action which does not initiate harm against another or their property. Knowing your own rights or freedoms is absolutely essential to preserving those rights and freedoms and being willing to protect them with force up to the lethal level if necessary will set a strong standard and message to any who would dare attempt to usurp your rights. Access to education and information. Freedom thrives where individuals have access to education and information. Again, remember the word liber in Latin means both book and freedom. So you cannot have freedom without knowledge. An informed and educated populace is better equipped to make rational decisions, engage in critical thinking, and participate consciously in the collective human effort. And finally, eternal vigilance. Freedom is not a static state. It requires constant vigilance to protect and preserve it. Every individual must remain educated and aware of their rights and active in the relentless preservation of them in all aspects of life. It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Source unknown. Now you might be thinking to yourself, wait, it was Aristotle that said that, right? No. This is a great example of not being dogmatic. Well, I saw it on the internet. It must be true. But if you actually research this, this was uh, falsely attributed to Aristotle by early writings. And then, much like the Mandela effect, once some sort of false idea uh, gets put out there, it becomes part of the collective consciousness and people start sharing it around without even questioning it. So, you know, they see it on a meme, it must be true, they spread it around, and so I made sure that my, my source was correct here. The important thing is to not stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing, Albert Einstein. So we'll get into the mental freedom principles. And there are quite a few, but I think this is a very good comprehensive list of everything that must be in place to keep your consciousness out of a box, to maintain your spiritual sovereignty and autonomy. So we'll just go through these quickly once, one by one. Open-mindedness. Be open to new ideas and different viewpoints. Avoid forming rigid, closed-minded judgments and be willing to revise your beliefs when presented with compelling evidence or alternative viewpoints. Critical thinking. Question, analyze, and evaluate information, beliefs, and ideas. Seek rational and evidence-based explanations. Encourage a healthy skepticism and willingness to explore multiple perspectives. Curiosity. Open-minded individuals are naturally curious. They have a thirst for knowledge and actively seek to learn from others and explore new ideas. Complexity and nuance. Open-mindedness involves an appreciation for the complexity of issues, a perceptiveness to nuance, and an understanding that many problems do not have simple explanations or solutions. Flexibility. They are adaptable and open to change. Open-minded people are willing to modify their beliefs or viewpoints in response to new evidence or compelling arguments. Self-awareness. Develop self-awareness to understand your own biases, prejudices, and cognitive blind spots. Recognize how your personal experiences, biases, and beliefs may influence your thinking. Develop mindfulness and self-reflective practices to better understand your thoughts, emotions, and reactions. This can help you manage your impulses and make more conscious decisions. Commitment to growth. Commit to lifelong learning and perpetual intellectual curiosity. 
seek out knowledge, explore different subjects and opposing viewpoints, and engage in intellectual pursuits that continuously challenge your thinking. Embrace personal growth as a lifelong journey. Continually strive to better understand yourself and the world around you, and be open to change and personal transformation. There are always new layers to uncover, new perspectives to discover. The journey never ends. Emotional intelligence. Cultivate emotional resilience and balance to cope with challenges, criticism, and uncertainty. Resilience and maturity enables you to adapt and maintain mental freedom even in difficult situations. Balance of emotion and reason. Discernment involves a balance between emotional intelligence and rational thinking. It enables individuals to consider both their emotions and logical analysis when making judgments. Healthy boundaries. Set healthy boundaries to protect your mental well-being. This includes boundaries in relationships, in managing your time and energy, and in controlling the information you consume. And this even means healthy boundaries in your beliefs. Never accept any belief system that attempts to diminish or gaslight your own autonomy, power, authenticity, or mental or spiritual efficacy. Do not tolerate people who are more concerned with being right than learning together or are out to attack you rather than have an honest conversation. A willingness to listen. Open-minded people are willing to listen attentively to others, giving them a fair chance to express their viewpoints without immediately dismissing or judging them. Suspending judgment. They refrain from form forming hasty judgments or opinions before fully understanding a situation or argument. Instead, they consider all available information before drawing conclusions. Notice this does not say avoiding judgment. It says suspending judgment. So just waiting, holding off, taking in more information first. Empathy. Open-mindedness often goes hand in hand with empathy. Open-minded individuals make an effort to understand the feelings, perspectives, and motivations of others, even if they don't agree with them. Respect for diversity. They respect and value diversity in thought, culture, and experience. They recognize that differences among people can enrich our understanding of the world. Humility. They maintain a humble attitude, recognizing that no one has all the answers and that they too are subject to biases and limitations. Embrace uncertainty. Open-mindedness involves tolerating and embracing ambiguity and uncertainty. It's an acknowledgement that not all questions have easy answers and that some issues may remain unsolved. Integrity. Consider the ethical implications of your beliefs, choices, and actions. Strive to make decisions that align with your values and principles and reinforce your honor and self-respect. Wisdom and insight. Discernment is associated with wisdom and insight. It reflects a deep understanding of natural law, human nature, motivation, and the consequences of actions that goes well beyond the mere intellect. Media and technology. Be mindful of your media and technology consumption. Limit exposure to content that may manipulate or polarize your thinking and curate your online environment to reduce negativity and misinformation. Experience and learning. Discernment often improves with experience and learning from past decisions. It can be honed over time through exposure to different situations and challenges. And time in nature. Engage your senses in the real world and natural world. Touch grass. Observe the cycles, systems, and patterns of nature. Watch and learn from animals. Conduct your own experiments. Build a personal relationship with natural law, reality, and yourself. I would rather have a mind opened by wonder than one closed by belief. The trouble with the world is not that people know too little, it is that they know so many things that just aren't so. So now we're going to get into the actual mindsets for holistic freedom. And these are based upon the triad, the trinity, and the trivium. Now I'm not going to spend much time on these because 
that would take all day and uh, I really just want to touch on them very briefly um, again if you want to cover this in more depth Trivium hacking does that uh, very well but this is a hierarchical system that are built upon one another you have mind body spirit which correspond to thoughts emotions and actions that is the trinity and then the trivium is knowledge understanding and wisdom so these three all perfectly overlay with each other to form a master system for discerning truth as well as properly aligned action so without going into great detail i highly encourage you to familiarize yourself with these the usage and alignment of these systems are absolutely vital to living a life uh, in a functional and purposeful way so again the big three are the biggest mind control programs for confining and boxing in your mind body and spirit and keep all three in discord with each other in order to restore unity and in internal integrity they must be uprooted and replaced with the natural mindsets so I will now give you what I consider to be the box free and natural states of being to the big three they are animism anarchism and individualism so animism is the mindset or worldview that all is mind the entire universe is consciousness and that all living beings including animals plants and even inanimate objects inanimate possess a spiritual essence or soul nature is seen as a web of interconnected spiritual forces and each element of the natural world is considered to have its own consciousness or spirit it underscores the idea that humans are just one part of the larger tapestry of existence and are interconnected with all living beings and elements of nature animism is based upon the natural laws of spirituality the universe and our place in it it represents the freedom of free will expression and exploration without the threat of eternal torture and damnation only self-imposed karma for not respecting the freedom of others it is about developing a direct living relationship with nature the universe reality itself and cosmic law and your own personal magic without any intermediary or doctrine it is about no longer seeing yourself as separate from nature and god every single thing in existence is literal as well as an archetype symbolic and a tool for developing consciousness from the magic to the mundane this is the pagan perspective so for example all of the the box the plant the lantern and the path all of these allegories that i've been using and the narrative behind it is actually paganism it's it's extrapolating lessons and wisdom from observing things from a symbolic or allegorical perspective this is one of the necessary perspectives to becoming a truly spiritual being all pure occult knowledge is of pagan origins via direct interface with nature by having this mindset by observing and much of it has been corrupted by the abrahamic mind virus so things like kabbalism uh, rosicrucianism they are rife and fraught with abrahamic programs this is why i prefer the more pure uh, pagan practices such as norse spirituality for example or commission because they are pre-christian it is vitally important to acknowledge that animism is not a religion anyone trying to make it one is bringing their bullshit cult programming into it and haven't done enough work and they're they're missing the point right you need to shed that mindset it's still running in the subconscious mind and that's going to cause problems and animism is the only true scientific perspective because what is science direct observation and experimentation right so if you're operating from dogmatism then that's not true uh, uh true science that's not a true truth discovery process 
In ancient Egyptian or Kamishan cosmology and spirituality, the concept of NTR, pronounced Netcher or Netter, holds significant importance. Netcher is often translated as God or divine force, but its meaning in the context of the ancient Egyptian thought goes beyond these simplistic translations. Netcher represents multiplicity and unity. The ancient Egyptians recognized a multitude of Netcher, each representing different aspects of the divine. These nature could be associated with natural elements, abstract concepts, or animal symbolism. Despite this diversity, there was also an understanding of an underlying unity connecting all. Nature were considered manifestations of cosmic principles that governed both the physical and metaphysical realms. They represented the force and energies that sustained the universe, natural law. The Netcher were seen as upholders of Ma'at, the cosmic principle of order, balance, and truth. Their roles included maintaining the harmony of the cosmos and ensuring the stability of the natural world. Within the ancient Egyptian pantheon, there was a hierarchy of Netcher, ranging from major deities like Ra, Osiris, and Isis to lesser known ones associated with specific places or concepts. The ancient Egyptians recognized the divine presence in the natural world. Animals, plants, and natural phenomena were often associated with specific nature, reflecting a deep understanding of the interconnectedness between humans, nature, and the environment. Nature were understood as both transcendent and imminent forces. They existed beyond the visible world, but also played a direct role in shaping earthly existence. And the Netcher were believed to be eternal and everlasting, reflecting the cyclical nature of existence and the continuity of divine principles. Again, principles are eternal. The concept of Netcher in Kamishan spirituality encapsulated a profound understanding of the divine forces that shaped the world and human experience. It was not a matter of religious belief, but a comprehensive worldview that influenced all aspects of life culture, and society in ancient Egypt. If you see the universe and self as reflections of itself in the mind of God, not separate but one, interacting through a unified sacred system of nature, you are an animist. See how there's no initiation, there's no uh, something you have to do to qualify. No, it's simply the name to describe the mindset. So if you have this mindset, then that's what you are. And all three of these will have this. So moving to the next one, we have anarchism. So anarchy is the understanding that all individuals are inherently free and sovereign beings, that their rights and freedoms are inalienable, and that no one has authority over them. It is based on the natural laws of human interaction the non-aggression and self-defense principles. Freedom of free will expression without the threat of physical violence, coercion, theft, and kidnapping, etc. It is the state of no masters and no slaves. This includes government, as well as petty criminals and abusive relationships, literally anyone who would violate your sovereignty. Anarchy does not mean chaos. That is a psyop, that is a obfuscation of truth and the true meaning of the word. It simply means no rulers, no masters. Voluntary interaction is the only moral way to conduct civilization and actually produces far better results than violence. Anything else is de facto slavery and its practicality is irrelevant. But Peaceful cooperation always works better than violent domination. If you believe in self-ownership and condemn slavery, you are an anarchist. And finally, we have individualism, the, the last of the big three replacement mindsets. Individualism is an existential philosophy that every person is distinct 
possessing innate rights and autonomy and should pri prioritize their own aspiration, values, and self-expression. In contrast to cultural conformity, individualism values personal agency, self-reliance, and the pursuit of individual happiness and fulfillment within a framework that respects personal liberties and rights. It stands in opposition to cultural norms that may stifle individuality in favor of herd mentality. It is based upon the natural laws of personal development and self-exploration. It is the freedom of free will expression without the threat of ostracization, public shaming, gaslighting, condemnation, etc. It is based in self-discovery and actualization, not conformity. Now, I would like to note, in the context of culture, there is nothing inherently wrong with certain aspects of culture or tradition. I think these things can actually be very beneficial in certain contexts. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be part of a whole, a community, or being proud of your lineage or your heritage. But it is prudent to be very cognizant of their place in our minds and our identities, especially when many of these ideas come from media, religion, etc. In other words, are forms of social engineering. If you develop your identity, formulate opinions, and make choices based on your own authentic individual preferences, tastes, and conscience, rather than what is popular, taboo, normalized, etc., you are an individualist. To be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. Now, for tying it all together, we have syncretism. Syncretism is an alternative and holistic approach to finding truth. Rather than following a set system and conforming to the rigid axioms of that tradition, a syncretist takes ideas and concepts from a wide scope of belief systems, religions, cultural practices, or philosophical ideas and blends them into a unified holistic viewpoint, personal and unique to that individual. Everyone's version will be different, yet ideally they all lead to the same truth. This has also been called omnism. This is what spirituality is all about. You chose to incarnate here as an individual, right? Why would you do that? Because you are God consciousness wanting to have a unique experience, to discover and explore itself through the individual. So you can see how all these different people following the exact same practice and tradition and, and rules and everything... That's going to create a, a, not a very diverse uh, a range of, of experiences or ways to discover truth, as opposed to the syncretic approach, which makes every single incarnation unique and individual. So the key distinction here is learning from and integrating aspects from many paths or traditions and not labeling yourself as one thing, putting yourself into that box and strictly following that one singular path. Secretism is based upon the idea that truth itself is consistent no matter the pathway used to reach it, right? It's, it's not about this gatekeeping nonsense that religions have of like, this is the only way to truth and everything else is a lie, right? All paths lead to truth because truth is what it is. There is no such thing as one path. With this in mind, the true parts of any system will overlap and harmonize, and the untrue aspects will conflict with one another. This approach creates a very useful and effective methodology for weeding out inconsistencies in one's beliefs and highlighting ideas which align across multiple traditions as well as reality itself. So again, paganism is the root of all occult knowledge, which is basically the roots of all syncretism. So why not go directly to the source instead of sifting and filtering through all the twists, traps, and snares? The age of the internet makes syncretism more accessible than ever, as you no longer even need to follow an exclusive lodge system to access this knowledge, again with the gatekeeping, right? 
This is the apocalypse where everything is just out in the open now. The syncretic mindset should be applied to all aspects of freedom, all aspects of self. It represents holistic non-conformity, total freedom to change and align yourself in any way you so choose, whether it be how to exercise your freedom, organize and structure your community, shape and actualize your identity, and navigate your spiritual experience and worldview. So long as these things are all aligned with truth and rooted firmly in real cosmic principles. So hopefully, I have helped to illuminate the ways to liberate any stifled consciousness from the box of dogma. So in conclusion, I'd like to just kind of reiterate some of the key points that I'm really trying to get across in my message here today. Acknowledge both profundity and fallibility. That is to say, the ability to know things and the ability to be wrong about things. Acknowledge that we as human beings are, are fallible and cannot know everything, but that does not mean that we know nothing, as many philosophers and gurus have said. We can know many things, deep, profound truths about ourselves and the universe. A belief which is true is called knowledge. A belief which is untrue is called dogma. And the only way to know the difference is to constantly put your beliefs to the test. Be confident, but not rigid. Be intelligent, but not godlike. Live by the principles of freedom. Know them deeply and fully integrate them into every aspect of your mind and being. Use them to navigate this spiritual experience. Never stop exploring, questioning, and growing. Never become stagnant or rigid in your beliefs. Keep questioning and questioning again. New information and asking questions can only do one of two things. Either you follow that rabbit hole and build even more conviction in your position by exploring that, or you find flaws and contradictions which will lead you closer to truth. It's a win-win, as long as you get your ego out of the way and be okay being wrong. So with that, be okay saying, I don't know. Some things we simply can't know, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with speculation and hypothetical exploration, but so many just have to have an opinion on everything instead of simply saying, I don't know, you know, I don't know enough to form an opinion, or I need to research that further before I say anything about it. It's okay to not know or to not have an opinion without sufficient information. This one is absolutely important. Do the inner work. Heal yourself from trauma. Do the shadow work. And therefore, freeing yourself from the mental chains of unstable or irrational emotions and beliefs. Release trauma-bonded identity constructs. Reconcile the schisms of your worldview. Develop a deep reverence and respect for truth. Realize and stand in your own personal sovereignty and free yourself from mental slavery. Develop holistic intelligence. Learn to use your intellect and your intuition, your logic and your creativity. Use them together. You, you are so much more intelligent and powerful when you're using all of that instead of just being locked into one side. And be okay letting go. You don't need a system. You don't need to live your life on rails. Learn the principles and let go of closed and formulaic systems. And adopt a syncretic mindset. Avoid labeling yourself or subscribing to rigid belief systems, especially when they deal with things that cannot be directly observed. Be a syncretist and an individualist. Build your own tapestry of knowledge and explore off the beaten path. Navigate by the light of your own mind, curiosity, courage, passion, and principles. Cultivate a direct relationship with nature and reality. Be your own scientist and question and test everything, even what you already hold to be true. To teach how to live without certainty and yet be 
without being paralyzed by hesitation is perhaps the chief thing that philosophy in our age can still do for those who study it. So in the garden of consciousness, there is hope. Just as a plant can be transplanted into more fertile soil to thrive, <clears throat> the mind can break free from the box of dogma by embracing open-mindedness, critical thinking, and a willingness to explore beyond the confines of preconceived notions. The box can be shattered. The roots of the mind can grow freely once more. It can reconnect with the nourishing soil of diverse ideas, and its branches can reach for the limitless sky of intellectual growth. In this allegory, the message is clear. Break free from the constraints of dogmatic thinking, allow your mental roots to explore, and let the branches of your mind stretch towards the boundless horizons of knowledge and understanding that await beyond the box. We are each born here into this world with an incredible gift, the gift of consciousness. To blindly follow another's words, truth, and directives is a tragic disgrace to that sacred gift. We are meant to explore the universe with our own senses and our own minds, hearts, and spirit to discover truth and actualize our gifts to become the greatest, most expansive and powerful version of our potential. That can never happen so long as we are abdicating that personal responsibility of being the stewards and captains of our own consciousness to any external authority. Only when we have reclaimed that autonomy and responsibility will we be able to shift the trajectory of humanity away from enslavement and destruction into freedom, abundance, and prosperity. So that's my presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned hopefully a thing or two. Don't forget to like the video. And if you want to learn more about the concepts I covered here, you can find me at The Wizard Factory on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, with YouTube being where I put most of my focus, especially with the long-form content and in-depth material. So thank you so much for sharing your time and attention with me today, and I hope to see you again over on my channel. Thank you very much.